September the 19th. And we'll start that with a roll call in just a moment. Here. Mark Donald. Joe Zach. Here. Larry Porter. Here. Rick Dreyer. Here. And just for the record, Mark is with his family down in Florida. So. Yeah. We have uh, two sets of minutes uh, before us that need to be uh, approved. Um, let's take a look at the August the 15th uh, set and it was a special meeting. Uh, anybody want to move to approve these or have them read further? Add to them? Change them? I make a motion we approve them. August 15th. Second. Second. Any discussion about that? Okay, all in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Okay, the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of August the 22nd. Anybody want to add to those or change them or? Make a motion we approve the minutes of August 22nd. Yeah, second. Any discussion or changes or Any edits or anything? Hearing none, all approve, all of, in favor of approving the minutes of August the 22nd. Raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Those are approved. Uh, next meeting is scheduled for August, uh, no, October the 17th, uh, here at 2.30. Um, so please mark your calendar about that. And we are ready to move on to our presentation. Uh, Mr. A couple Chairman, of Mr. Chairman uh, we just, uh, Dan was just reminding me that we will have a, uh, if you wish to go ahead and meet on the 17th, that's fine. Just wanted to let you know that a number of uh, the directors won't be there. So if you want to go ahead and have it, we'll have uh, deputy directors attend if you want to go ahead or if you want to reschedule it. Just want to let you know that my, I won't be there or Dan or Lisa at that. Well, meeting. I don't know that there's anything to, that says we can't change it because of that kind of a thing. <laughs> Would anybody want to look at their calendars and come up with another date? I would certainly want to have it somewhat consistent, like on Thursday. Hmm? 24th. Well, 24th looks like, please. Perfect for me. I can't have a meeting without Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Does the 24th work for you guys? Um, 17th works fine for me. I yeah, guess. right. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I won't be here on the 24th, but we could work around that. No, that's a problem. No, that's not a problem. You just keep doing what you're doing, Mark. Dan, you just stay where you're at. Oh, that would be bad. Well, I don't want to go on to the 31st. That's a bad day for meetings. 24th. I don't want to do it. Um, 24th work for most everybody doesn't work for you. Rick? And it works for you? Doesn't work? You guys, darling? Okay. I make the motion we move the 17th meeting to the 24th. Any discussion about that? Further discussion? Second. Second. Any further discussion about moving the next meeting from the 17th of October to the 24th of October so that staff can attend? Nope. All in favor say or raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. <laughs> okay, make a note of that. Um, a couple, three things. You'll notice that the tables have been moved around a little bit. We're getting some comment from the city council and from uh, constituents of the city 
that they're not able to see us all or hear us all on the camera from time to time. So the camera's here. We've moved in closer all the way around. We don't have to yell at those guys on the other side of the table as much. And hopefully this will uh, work out for us. So that's one thing. Another thing is if you're going to have a, any kind of a long speech, more than, say, three minutes or so, we'd like for you to go to the podium. So, again, the camera can get that. And we're not getting the back of anybody's head or whatever because they want, I guess they want to be able to see who's yakking. So uh, if, if, we, if we can do that, uh, that would be great. Um, the other thing that we will always try to do just by way of housekeeping rules is to get out of here in an hour. Uh, last time with a major presentation at all, it took an hour and a half uh, or two or three. I forget, maybe four. It's a long meeting. At any rate, uh, hopefully this design will help some uh, with the camera thing. Uh, speaking from the podium, you can get the camera on you there. And uh, that's that. Any other housekeeping ideas? Anything anybody wants to bring up? Nope. Okay, great. We are ready for a major presentation then. Mark Randall. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, you remember at our last meeting, uh, we talked about the proposed or preliminary new rate design that we've been working on for uh, IPL. And uh, we were talking about how that new design uh, would reflect the rate cuts that the, was recently authorized by the city council and that would result in very low rates that would go with the very high level of reliability that we already have. So at that meeting, though, uh, PUAB members, if you recall, were wanting to know how did that rate comparison look both with and without uh, the inclusion of taxes. And uh, you're also interested to know how those statistics that were provided compared to the EIA statistics, which you've also been uh, looking at. So what we did uh, in response to your uh, questions from last meeting, we prepared this presentation. And uh, my hat's off to Robert Stilwell and Mike Kozar over here with rates, our rates people to, uh, who put this together. Uh, and the attempt uh, here is to show the new, uh, the proposed rates uh, both with and without uh, the taxes and to show how this compares to other metrics uh, of rate comparison. So with that, I'd like to, Mr. Chairman, if, with your permission, turn it over to Robert Stilwell. Uh, thank you. Again, I'm Robert Stilwell. I'm the Planning and Rates Supervisor as well as the Acting Utility Finance Manager for Power and Light. And as Jerry mentioned, we're trying to keep this under an hour, so I'll try to go quickly. If you have questions, ask me, uh, and if you want to save them or ask me as we go, but I'll try to go through this as fast as I can. Uh, again, uh, we're trying to just show how rates and bills compare. Uh, so we tried to say, how do we want to do this? So we have, who are our customers, IPL customers? How do seasons and usage affect your bill? And then how do we bills compare? So here's an overview of our customers. We have about 57, over 57,000 customers. About 91% are, are residentials, and we have about 9% that are commercial and industrial non-residential customers. And as the breakdown of the share of the retail customers, of that 91%, you know, when you take it into its own pie, 83% of the 80 plus percent is general service, which is what we call our RS3 rate, which is our residential general service. Then we have the other ones, the space heating, the water heating. Um, we have residential space heating and water heating, which says zeros because they're so small. I think we have a total of um, 80 something that are on that one. Our, so our numbers are fairly small, but that's a breakdown just just to let you know where our break customers are. Here is a typical distribution. And what we did is we took the last 12 months of usage for all residential customers and we plotted it on a graph. So you can see where your average usage is. Uh, because this is one of the key things we talk about. What's an average customer? What's a low customer? What do we classify as a high customer? So it's a typical bell curve uh, with the shutoff at zero because obviously we can't go negative. Um, well, I guess technically we can with our net metering customers, but we don't have very many of those. So we're looking at the 
uh, without the net meterings. So uh, the 25 percentile, what we call low, you know, is about 500 kilowatts on, of energy every month on an annual basis. The average is about 776 kilowatt hours on a month every, you know, for each month. You know, that also, this is what it is on average. You're going to use in one month higher, another month lower. So this is basically an average of what our customers use. And then the last top 25% is about 1,000, you know, 1,100 kilowatt hours. Now, obviously, the spread on the high side is because we have a lot of people that use a lot more but there are not very many numbers because uh, that includes people who have, say, special uh, heating during the, you know, electric space heating during the winter or that type of stuff, which is going to cause them to go higher. So this is where we have what we define as our low, average, and high customers. So the usage and where we stand. Now, that's what your usage is. Seasonality is another key factor is. What we have is a graph of, the bottom graph is the person that's in that 25 percentile that's on the lowest every month. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. On the slide back on the bar graph. Yes, sir. That one? Yes, sir. Low is higher than high, and I don't understand that. That's just where we put the arrow. The usage. This is usage on the bottom. Okay. So their usage in this is about 500 kilowatts. A month. The high is about 1,100 kilowatts. You know, yes, average shows it's even higher, but it's just we're just pointing to on the bar where they stand. Like a typical bell curve that you think of uh, when you're at school, you have where things are average around the 70, and you got people that have the A's up in the 90s and the the D's and F that are lower than that. It's just where the predominance of our usage is falls. Percentile, 25 percent. So the 25 percentile. Never be the same. <coughs> okay. Is it, I mean, um, are these figures that you're showing us here the same as what we we saw in the earlier rate study report when they defined uh, low and high users? Um, we've updated ours a little bit more, so they're slightly different. They're very close, but they're a little bit different on the stuff but it's in the same range. I think their average user, we have 776, and I think their, uh, for our annual average, was like 800. So uh, it's close. We just did a, to be honest, we took a quick dump from the data system that we have and grabbed and graphed it for the last 12 months. So yours is really the more accurate figure. I wouldn't say it's more accurate, it's more current. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna, gonna say that they weren't accurate. They were accurate, it's just ours is more current. Okay. Yes, sir. Where do you personally, where do your usage fit in here? Uh, my usage would probably be somewhere between the um, average and to the high is where my personal home usage is. You know, but I also have uh, seven people living in my house. Uh, so it's be on the more on the high side with kids and all that. And I've got my mother in law living with us, too. OK. So seasonality, you can see we have an average. That average of 776 was for a, you know, looking at all 12 months altogether, where does it fall? When you take somebody who's in the 50th percentile by month, it varies by month. So you'll see on the low end, they're a little over 400 in January, and they go down, and then they go up for the summer because of the heating or for the air conditioning and all this stuff. Then they go down, and they start going back up. You'll notice that the dips are right around what we call our shoulder months when people you know, when it's April, May, uh, when the weather's around 70 degrees, you turn everything off and you don't use very much. You don't have your AC or your heater going. So you'll see that. And you'll see it dramatically increases during the summer because of uh, the heat, the electric AC and all that stuff that goes on. So you can see the pattern is fairly similar, but you can see that it varies based upon which classification you're in, your 25% average or whatever. So we take this seasonal usage to come up with what the bills will be. And that's an example of a single month where a, during that month, uh, if you take what that usage is, it would be $122, $177, and $241. The rates are the same, but their usage changes because they have either a, a bigger house, they have more, custom, you know, more 
people in the house. Uh, they don't have insulation. There's a variety of things that will lead to difference in usage. So the majority of our IPL customers are residential and their bills will vary significantly throughout the year because of usage. You know, the rates are fairly close. So your bill may be different than your next door neighbor. You know, I'm sure my next door neighbor has a completely different rate, not rate, they have the same rate, but they have a different usage than I do. So when we do our billing comparison, what goes into a residential bill? And most of this is gonna be based upon residential customer billing because that's where most of our customers are and that's where we spend our time. In the proposed environment, as well as with GMO, KCPL, and all that stuff, there's a customer charge. In our current environment, we do not have a customer charge. We have a minimum bill. Then you have an energy charge, which is going to be based upon how much you use. In our current environment, you could be up to five different you know, billing buckets, tiers, whatever you want to call it. In our proposed, we're going to go to a single tier. We also have the fuel cost adjustment that we currently have. Uh, in the new proposed, that will be re-baseline to zero, basically we'll reset it. Plus there are additional charges and riders that come on. Um, and then you also have the pilot franchise fees and gross receipts tax and, ta and then sales tax. So if you look at what's in our current bill, taking that average residential customer during the summer, 776, this is how you would calculate their bill, calculates. You have almost $100 in energy charge you have the rest is FCA and sales tax. What you'll notice in there is we don't have any gross receipts in there because right now our rates currently have the gross receipts in, embedded into our rates. And the new proposed structure, we won't. So that customer has 776. You know, this is a average customer, not a particular customer. In the proposed or in the discounted where we've taken the 6% off, you'll notice that they've gone from 117 to 110. Again, they've got the same categories. We've just basically shifted everything down by about 6%. In the proposed environment, we're going to have about the same rate for that customer as the 6% because our goal is to make sure that they get at least their 6%. But it's going to be broken up a little bit differently. Not much, but a little bit. We're going to have the energy charge, which the energy charge will be less for this customer than it currently is. But then we have a customer charge and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to separate out gross receipts tax and it'll be a separate line item on your bill so that it's not included in our rates. It'll be a separate line item, the 9.08 cents, and then you'll have the sales tax. So this shows, you know, the way the rates has been proposed by Burns and McDonald shows, excuse me, you're going to be getting, you know, your 6% and that's the breakdown of it. Now we always do a comparison. It's like, how do we compare against GMO? Well, GMO is this little green area, as well as the orange, let's say, yeah. They're the green area. The orange area is actually KCPL Missouri. So GMO covers a variety of areas, and those include Lee Summit and Blue Springs are a couple of those things. So how would a person with 776 kilowatts in GMO's territory be in Lee Summit and Blue Springs? As you notice, their energy charge is there, then they have their FCA, and then they have the customer charge. So they're up to about where we stand. Then they also have a DSIM rider, which is a demand side integrated management rider. Then they have a ResRAM rider, which is an additional rider they have on top of that. Then they have their gross receipt or franchise fees. And you'll notice that up until the ResRAM, the, both customers in Lee Summit and Blue Spring have basically the same information. That costs. But once you get into it, you get into gross receipts. And the reason it's different is because Blue Springs has a 5% franchise fee. Lee Summit has a 7.5% franchise fee. Uh, Independence currently is at the 9.08%. So there is a difference in that. Explain ResRAM. ResRAM is the renewable energy. Um, it's, it's basically an extra charge that KCPL puts onto people's bills so that they can collect a little bit more money and put it into a pot to then use towards uh, like it's energy to offset. efficiency and renewable energy investments that they're going to make into the future. Right. It's basically so, setting up a separate savings account for KCP. Because when they put in, when people put in the renewables and they do the renewables, people are using less energy. So it's a mechanism they have to recoup some of that inner, that revenue they would have lost through revenues through their energy sales. But it's a separate rider they have on top of theirs. Which, which 
we have the same things just on a voluntary basis for our our. Uh, you have we have the so the community solar yeah. uh, option to purchase into yes the res ram is not an optional right. item. For I guess Gino. I guess that dollar amount is so small it's it's not showing up on your chart. Um, we didn't put the average customer with a with CSP. Um, right now we we're not completely sold out of the community solar farm, uh, and we you know that could be something we'd add. But if you took on average, it would be very small. Yeah. What would impact it? Yeah. And then sales tax, and they're actually slightly different on some of that. I believe that uh, Blue Springs has a one percent sales tax on their bill. And I believe that uh, Lee Summit has a 1.5% sales tax versus our 1.125%. So the way we, we talked about last time is that the areas that are in the gray and the black are areas that do affect our customer that will show up on their bills, but it's something that the power and light doesn't have control of. You know, it's something, it's a decision by city. But they are a factor of something a customer would have to pay on their bill. <clears throat> So this gets back to your request that we had to breaking it out instead of what we previously did, we took rates and then we added the 9%, you know, 9.08, assuming they were served in independence, what they would be. Now what we've done is trying to shift our comparisons around to what they are in that city as a compared to what they are in independence. So again, this is an estimated bill for one customer one month. It's not what their average is gonna be for every month because their usage will vary by month. So we just chose the one month, one energy usage under the proposed rates. So if we calculate, which we do when we do our bill comparison, we calculate how much is their usage. We take that seasonality, which we had shown previously during the year and put it in. So in all in residential bills month to month, what you can see is we take that seasonality, this is for our average customer that we took, and you can see what their average bill would be in January, February, March, and all that stuff. And we've highlighted the blue numbers, you know, the summer months, because that's when you're on the on-peak season, as we have in our billing system, versus the off-peak season. So you can see your bill will vary from $73 to almost $200 for a single customer based upon their average use. So when we do our analysis and we look at what is the average residential, we take that thing and we say, okay, we take all the revenues to, and charges up together and we divide it by the number of months. And that's where we get that an average customer's bill will be 109. Will their bill ever be 109? It's possible, but in this analysis, their bill is never exactly 109 for a single month. It's less than or more, just because we're taking the average of all that stuff. So we did the same usage and we applied it not only to IPL's proposed rates, but we did it at Lee Summit, Blue Springs. We also included KCPL Mo, which is a KCPL Missouri. We also did Olathe, which is Kansas City, KCPL Kansas City. And then we did KCK, which is BPU. And this shows what their average all in rate is or charge on their bill. As you can see, we're about equal to Lee Summit on average. Blue Springs is a little bit cheaper than us, you know, $3. KCPL Missouri, which we've shown, um, which is KCPL Missouri, they're higher than us. Kansas City, KCPL Kansas City and KCPL BPU, you know, we're less than they are. On an all-in, taking into consideration the, you know, the various franchise fees and all that stuff that exists on these customers' bills. So... If you back out, which is what we're going, the gross receipts and taxes, and you look at it straight rates only, not what their sales tax, what their franchise fee, it shows that our proposed rates are going to be less than GMOs, KCPL Missouri, KCPL Kansas, KCP, KCBPU, based upon our average customer usage. But the customer's bill, as we saw two slides before, are gonna be a little bit higher than Blue Springs because of all the different sales tax and gross receipts that they have on top of that. So that's where some of the confusion comes. What way do you compare? What we used to typically compare when I was doing it previously, we would look at our rates and then we would apply a nine per, the same sales, same gross receipts, the 9.08, 
to say if they were serving an independence customer in independence, this is what their bill would be. And that's how I've always done it for my 10 years being here. But now we're being asked not to do that, compare it to what their actual franchise fees are, their sales tax and all that stuff. So while it shows that we're cheaper, you know, if you look at it, the total bill, we're actually just slightly more than the Blue Springs. But previously, um, you know, but compared to everybody else, we're in the ballpark. Our rates that are being proposed are going to make us one of the cheapest. Our rates, and I go back to our rates, will be one of the cheapest in the metropolitan area, which was a goal that we had. So, on average, our all-in rates are competitive with our neighbors, as I said. Our bills may be higher or lowing depending on what time of the year it is and what usage is. We had nobody that actually met the actual average. And certain cities can be lower on average because of gross receipts and sales tax. But if you remove that out, which is what we said in the proposal from Burns and Mac, <coughs> is our IPL rates will be the lowest in the air, as previously stated. So that's a bill comparison. One of the other things that's been brought up is, wait, you know. Wait, 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 go back. Go yes, back. sir. Your last dot point, I think yes. that shouldn't be the average bills. That should be the average rates. No, these no. are bills. Excluding no. gross receipts and taxes. Yes. Average bills using excluding receipts, gross receipts and taxes. Oh, okay. So, okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. yes, you, you are correct. Instead of saying bills, we could say our average rate. But it's it would be their bill without those taxes. Right. But we are going to be, you know, the lowest in the area. You know, and one of the things we keep getting asked about is EIA. EIA is the Energy Information Administration. It's part of you know, the Department of Energy in Washington, DC, official, you know, stat keeper for the government. And they do every, and I would say every year they have the 861, but it's actually a monthly. We do monthly reporting, then we do an annual 861 annual true up. And this collects information on revenue from sales to customers by utilities across the United States. And they publish an average retail price of electricity. You know, it, the most published rate came out in 18 using 2017 data. I guess there is a early release for 2018 based or 2019 for 2018 data, but the next, the final release will be in November. So a lot of the stuff we're showing is the last, you know, the 18. What is the benefit? EIA is good information to use as a measuring stick, as I say. It's consistent methodology. It covers the whole United States, considers utility revenues and sales, and allows see, utilities to see where they compare in their revenues to their cost of service. But the one thing that I've been trying to say is that the key, it's not a fallacy, the price of electricity is not a rate. You know, people say, well, our rate is this. Well, it's not. The EIA rate, EIA price of electricity is not the same as a rate. That's not what the customer gets charged. It's the all-in revenues, sales tax, it's, you know, any additional fees such as a private lighting or surge protectors or things like that that will be added to them, everything that's collected. It is an average revenue, not a rate. You know, as we say, almost no one is actually paying IPLs published from 2017 at 14.28 cents per kilowatt hour. You know, and it is not, I like to say, it cannot be used to compare the bills because it's not a rate and rates of independence to those of utilities. It is good to show us where we stand in a direction and it points out some issues. Uh, that we need to be looking at and all that stuff, but it is not the end-all be-all to say we are higher or lower. You know, why is it the case? What they do is they take the revenues that they received divided by the kilowatt sales that are reported, and it comes out to a price of electricity. So in 2017, this was our residential revenue, and our residential sales, we came out to 14.28. And here's the graph that we've shown in the past. KCPL Missouri is at 14.654. You know, where we stand, the United States average is 12.23. You know, where we stand and all those things. Based upon this, yes, we are definitely higher. You know, if you take independence as your measuring stick, we're 2.5% less than KCPL Missouri. 
but we are upwards of 26% less in Springfield. But GMO is what we've been looking at, and that's about 21%. But there's a lot of things in. We just, you know, when we looked at a average customer, you know, GMO, GMO is both Lee Summit and Springfield. We're only about three percent off of higher all-in Blue Springs versus Lee. You know, and we're about the same as Lee Summit. So why is it different? You know, again, electric price of electricity is not a rate. One of the things. We talk about we come up with the 14.28. We're based upon the stats, but another thing we can show in this is independent customers, on average, use less than GMO customers. Now, there's a question: Why is that? Um, Burns and McDonald, when they were here, and they've talked <coughs> about is the customer mix that they have. They have a lot of customers that have electric heat more than we do. So it depends on your mix of your equipment. And GMO is a lot larger area than just Blue Summit, Blue Springs, it's a large area. They're using almost 25% more energy on average than independence customers. Hmm. So if we take the average usage, the 792, and put it into our model, we get $115 in the proposed model. That's going to come out to 14.52. Wait a second, that's more than the 14.28. Okay. That's still a little bit different. But if we put GMO's usage in, 14, oh, actually, let me rephrase this. This says if we put our usage in GMO's rates, exactly, and we put our average usage in GMO's usage, at 792, you come out at 115, you're at 14.52. Your cents per kilowatt is 14.52. With the exact same rates, if they were in independence and everything, and you put GMO's average usage, they're at 141, which comes out to 14.91. So with the exact same rates, you get different numbers, and a lot of that's because of usage and how the rate structures are and all that stuff. So this is another thing that I've always said that we've had an issue is independence customers on average use less than GMO and some of the other ones. We, so it's something that needs to be considered. Does this invalidate EIA? No. It doesn't invalidate it. But what it shows is the EIA numbers do not reflect what their actual rates are. So even if GMO rates, we match GMO rates exactly, and they appear cheaper, we'll still be higher on average in GMO, predominantly because our customers use less. Why is that? Is that because we have more apartments? Is that because, you know, there's a variety of things that cause that. So we can't say it's the same thing as rates. Is it a good guidepost? Yes, you know, but it doesn't. EIA doesn't necessarily tell you how it's going to actually impact the customer's wallet. You know, we contacted EIA, and I'm going to bring up a way of thing. You know, it says it has to report all revenue, including pilots, your taxes, and other. You know, but EIA specifically told us some utilities do not. You know, we've talked to KCPL; they're still not sure they report all their stuff. You know, EIA says this is how you need to report, but they can't guarantee that everybody's doing it. One of the things I'll say about this that's been brought up to our case, uh, for independence, we report, we have 12 industrial customers. Well, that basis that we've always reported upon is because that's based upon customers that take service at a at primary or higher voltage service as opposed to the standard secondary. But we've got customers in there <coughs> that aren't necessarily industrial customers. So because we've not been able to pull out and say they're a manufacturing or industrial customer, that was the way independence has always provided our information is based upon who's taking it primary level service. Yes, Mr. Mike. Just to like clarify. You want a microphone? So, oh, yeah. Uh, can everybody hear me? No, we need the, No, I need a microphone. Okay. Um, just to add a little bit of a... A finer point on that, the EIA has really strict definitions for what is industrial and what is commercial. And it's based on something called the North American Industrial Classification System. It's a multi-number code that basically every company submits and says, you know, I'm this sort of um, company, I'm a manufacturing company, I'm a forestry company, what have you. That's what the EIA uses to decide whether somebody's commercial or industrial. Independence 
has never tracked that information. It's just not data that we have. It's never been in our billing system. So we've done our best in reporting to think, okay, well, who's more likely to be an industrial customer? Probably somebody who uses primary voltage. That's the course that we've gone because of the information that we had available. But this is an example of how the EIA asks you to report in a certain way, but for reasons outside of your control, you can't report in exactly the way that they want you to. And that kind of affects the numbers that then the EIA churns out later on. That's really out of everybody's control. But it was brought to our attention and with the new billing system, we're gonna see if maybe we can do a better job you know, tracking this information. But historically, we had no way of doing this information. But I would say it's something we need to be looking at it. And that's something I'll take on. You know, the published price of EIA electricity is not cents per kilowatt what they will actually pay. You know, it does not speak to the rates. It is not what a specific rates are. So, and when you look at what the Electric Power Monthly is what EIA puts out says that they specifically have in their statement that it does not reflect the per kilowatt rate charged by the electric utility to the individual customers. Electric utilities typically employ a number of rate schedules within a single schedule. You know, right now with our residential, we've got five different rate schedules that go in. So we have nobody who pays a particular one. On the industrial, we have three different rate schedules. You know, I was asked saying, so who's paying this 7.8% or 7.8 cents? And I say, nobody. What that is is an average of the historical usage and all that stuff. It depends on what their usage are, the number of customers, that type of stuff. You know, I will say one of the hardest questions I get asked, and I get to ask this many times, and I cringe, and I shouldn't, but I do, is people say, what is your average rate? It depends on what your usage, what your rate schedule is. You know, I come up with these averages saying, okay, on average, a residential uses, you know, 13 cents a kilowatt hour, but it depends on what their usage is. You know, that's one of the hardest questions that, you know, which seems simple, but it's not a simple answer, at least in my opinion, because I've looked at the numbers. So, so at conclusions, it's the average, it's not the actual bills from independence. You know, we can come up, we can't come up with the same thing. EIA doesn't reflect what people pay in independence. It's an average. It includes a lot of stuff in there. And it does not reflect what our actual customers are charged. And I will also say, we're looking at stuff that was from 2017. Our rates have changed. We've got the 6% in now. So our numbers are going to be lower. You know, I will also say, KCPL, GMO, you know, KCPL, Murray, GMO, BPU. People have had rate changes in the last two years. I believe GMO has gone up and down um, both directions. Uh, they went down because of the sales, uh, the tax changes, not because of their cost. But, you know, rates change. So we're looking at stuff that's two years in the past. You know, it's a good guideline in the direction we need to look at and see what it's going. But it doesn't say where we, people stand right now. You know, it's benchmarking. It gives you a good, you know, it can give you a different conclusion of what's happening with EIA versus the actual customers. It doesn't take into the actual rate counts. You know, this is why when we do our rate comparison, we take a usage, average usage, and compare it with our rate structure, with G GMO's rate structure, with BPU's rate structure, all that stuff to do that. What we used to do is we applied everybody with the same gross receipts and we ignored sales tax. What we're going to start doing now, which we've started doing here, is that we're taking into consideration their sales tax at their location, as well as what their gross receipts. And I, we threw these in literally um, yesterday to give some information on small you know, commercial stuff to see where we stand. Based upon the new rate structure that we have, including the gross receipts tax, IPL is coming in at, sorry, it's not showing up on mine. Yeah, $67 on average, including in independence. If you're in Kansas, you're at 64, you're at 63, in the Missouri small, GMO, you're at 72. We're in the ballpark, but we're not there yet. You know, we are cheaper than, you know, KCVPUs. And then on large customers' findings. 
you know, if you look at it, we're all fairly close, but do we have room to improve? Yes. You know, we're getting there. We're going to work on it. And, you know, with the new rate structure, that's going to help. And then once we have that going for a bit, we can see what else we can do going forward. So, so are, are, are these your, your small commercial and large commercial? Um, is that including the 6% reduction or not? Yes. It is, okay. So I tried to go quickly. I hope this has been helpful on how we do our bill comparisons and why they're a little different. Again, EIA is a great information. It's a good yardstick, but it's not, as I use the term today, it doesn't need to be the hammer on us. It points us in the direction, you know, it's a signpost, a guidepost, whatever, you know, but we need to be taking that into consideration, but that's not the end all be all. Any other questions? Not a question, just a comment. I appreciate this presentation. I think it, it clarifies a lot of issues that we've had. You got turned and, off. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it did. Uh, I appreciate the presentation. I think it clarifies a lot of the questions that we've had. And I appreciate your uh, saying that you want to uh, clean up some of the definitional issues that we have right now, particularly in the industrial <coughs> area where we've got some things that just don't seem right uh, in the category that are showing up as industrial. So you said you right. were going to try and clean that up, so I appreciate that. Uh, the only, re only thing I can figure is why we – that um, – uh, say Booth Springs or Green Valley would have a higher usage than we do. It may be because of demographics. They have younger families. And we have an older population where we have a single adult living or, or two elderly people living, whereas most of their population is going to be families with children. And so you would expect um, that the usage may be higher because of, just like in your own family that mm -hmm. you talked about. I don't know if that's the main reason, but that I was just trying to under, think through that, why that why we're seeing such a really quite dramatic difference between the, the two geographic areas, and that may be part of the reason. It's demographics. It could be housing. It could be a variety of things. Again, I go back to what I was told by Burns and McDonald. They have GMO in the outlying areas. They have a lot of customers that don't have gas service, so they have electric heat. So they might have more customers that are on electric heat. If you have electric heat, you typically use more, especially during the winter. So there's a variety of things. You know, it, again, it's stuff that needs to be understood, and you know, but it's a way to understand there are differences in some of this stuff. I mean, is that yeah, it? Yeah, I have, uh, I have something. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, is this the final rate study that's going to go to the council, or has it already gone? Well, we're going to get to that in just a minute. Oh, okay. Wait. I'll wait. Sorry. Okay. Well, thanks very much for your presentation. I'm sure that there's going to be other questions yeah. as we get through this. And oh, there. I'm sure there are. And as I've always said, if you have questions, come ask us. You know. We'll work through things. We may not always eat, see eye to eye on some of this stuff, but I'm willing to understand things and why. You know, it's through this I've understood, you know, how we've reported industrial may be wrong. Okay. You know, we need to understand. But it was the best way we could do it at the time. Hopefully now we'll have better systems to be able to do this stuff better. So. the questions? Thanks so very, very much. Thank you. Mark, you have the floor. Yes, well, this is uh, uh, kind of answers Larry's question. Um, the presentation was primarily, uh, I mean, it's very consistent with what uh, the rate design uh, was and, and, it, and is, it's being proposed. But uh, just as recently as uh, this, this afternoon, the uh, Council Rates Subcommittee uh, met to talk about the uh, rate design and uh, some making some recommendations and they would we're presenting this to you now it's going around it's very similar to what you all had talked about last time and 
if you're comfortable with it, we'd like to see if the if the PUAB would uh, vote to uh, support this uh, recommendation that the uh, uh, rates committee made. So basically, what they're saying, uh, as you can see, is that the uh, original rate design that we talked about was uh, going to it was kind of a bit of a compromise. We were going to have that six percent was going to apply minimum six percent to all residential customers, but it was going to be an average six percent for commercial when we talked about it last meeting. But uh, the the uh, after the input and uh, and. Uh, the subcommittee's debate on this and discussions, they decided that this is their recommendation, is that there will be no, that everyone would have a minimum, every rate would have a minimum of a 6% rate reduction. Uh, they also said that they would uh, implement a five-year moratorium on rate increases, of course, subject to emergency situations. Uh, third, to consolidate rates uh, from the 12 that was in the original recommendation to five because it seemed as though there was some uh, desire to see a, even a smaller uh, number of rates similar to what was in the Solville study. So what we're going to do is mirror the Solville study uh, exactly in those uh, in the number of rates and uh, are the the amount the the rates design that we had before we can uh, make that. Uh, so, some we can summarize the rates in the in a way that will mirror uh, what was in Solvel, if that's what's desired. Uh, that did show that we would have um, adders and riders, which you know obviously the the fuel cost adjustment, then economic development rider, a regulatory and environmental compliance rider, and customer generator net metering contract service rider, and um, then uh, that we would also maintain the current gross receipts uh, tax of nine point oh eight. So that's pretty close, I think, to what uh, PUAB seemed to be favoring at the last meeting. Um, and so if, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'd consider it uh, appropriate, we'd love to have PUAB voice their support for this uh, recommendation being made by the Power and Light uh, Acosta Service, uh, I mean, I should say the, the city, the council rates subcommittee. So. Um, if there's any questions, we'd love to visit about them. All right, I can go, I'll go ahead, Jack. Excuse me. How can the board be assured that the five-year moratorium will keep IPNL operable and and, uh, and have the correct cash flow to operate? Well, we think that it can be done, and as it says, there would be any you know the uh, if an emergency situation present itself, then we could re, you know, look at that again. But our intent would be to do the five-year moratorium, which we believe is doable, and that's the direction that they're giving us. Okay, I well, guess that's the best assurance I can give. We, no doubt, is a council, but uh, who, who uh, did the figures on this? Who actually determined it? Uh, determine which, which part the, of it? That there's enough income to support the utility Five for five years. Um, when Burns and Mac did their latest study, which included the 6% and all that stuff, it showed that we were financially solvent and would be able to maintain uh, no rate increases for five years. Okay. So that's where our basis and our discussion was getting at to do all right. that. Thank you. Hang on, Robert. What about the uh, fuel adjustment? What are you still planning on a yearly? My goal is yes, it, it will be a yearly, and the first year will be set at zero, and then it will be uh, evaluated based upon what our fuel costs are projected to be, plus any true ups under overages that we have, and it could potentially be a credit. Did, well, I'm just concerned that I think that's too long of a period of time. I, if you have a high fuel cost for a year and you put it that the next year, then you're paying that for the next year, for a whole year, before you adjust it again. I, I just think six months would be the best myself. The, what was originally proposed in Solvel 
and what I've used as my guideline when talking to Burns and McDonald is it would be an annual, but we have the ability, we'll be maintaining it on a monthly basis and we have the ability to, if need be, a six month adjustment or that type of thing. The plan would be for 12 months to see where we stand to make sure we're not over or under, but we have the ability to review it every six months. Okay, yeah, but goal. what I'm getting at is you're asking us to approve something and it, and I appreciate what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I don't have it here in black and white, you know, and, and that's what I'm looking at. Uh, I'm not say, trying to hold anybody accountable. Yeah, I am. I'm trying to hold you accountable. Yes. <laughs> and, and we should be held accountable. What was passed was passed by the Electric Utility Committee as their guidelines and stuff. What I will say is we're, Burns McDonald's finishing up the writing of the report we still have to modify or basically take theirs as a foundation and then put in the additional attributes to ensure that people are getting their 6% and that type of stuff. So what I think you're being asked is the recommendation. That's where we're going. This is not approving the rates without having seen the rates or the schedules and all that stuff. That still will have to go forward. Right. It'll be, it'll be a, it'll be a, as one of the writers that we have currently and all that oh, stuff. Okay. So this isn't the final approval. That, this isn't the final then right no, here. No, I think it, the way I interpreted this, this is the direction we're going to be and where we're going. Well, this what? doesn't actually say whether it's annual or six months. Right. It's just saying that that's a thing that has to be part of the rate. Okay. Plan. I appreciate that. But uh, will we, this board, see the final before it goes to council? Uh, the, yes, I would anticipate that would be because that's the process we need to go through. So we haven't drawn up all the rate schedules. We haven't put it all together. We still have some take Burns and Mac. They're supposed to, I think, be done uh, hopefully by the end of this month. And then we'll take that and modify, you know, take it to make the adjustments that we need to meet the requirements of the desires that are needed for the council. So if the board wishes to make a recommendation about six months versus annual, we'd be happy to take that back as well so i mean no that that's fine if you're going to do what you're saying yeah. but I, I would like to have it in black and white that in six months in there you look at it and say whoops we're a little high we're we got over yeah i over. and i'm more than happy to include that i mean you know like i said we're going to build off of what was in the Solvel. um we didn't get into the actual they did more of the rate schedule write-ups then Burns and McDonald. Burns and McDonald has been doing the analysis and stuff. We're going to have to take Burns and McDonald's numbers and then put them into rate schedules. And those are going to have to go before you and before the council before it's final approved. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm not going to approve anything until I see the final. Uh, my vote anyway. Thank you, Robert. Can you, ex can you explain this uh, customer generator net metering contract service writer? Uh, that's what we currently have right now. Where customers, what is it? What does it do? What it is is when customers have um, renewable energy, predominantly solar, not all, but 99.9% .9 or have solar panels on their house. When they, we have a basically we have a two-way meter. We measure what they send back to us. If they're overproducing and not using all the energy they produce off their solar panels, uh, they get a credit for that. And then anything they use from us, you know, they pay for. So basically we net out. So for example, if a customer's panels produced a thousand, they use 500 within their system during the month. And then they used an additional, uh, so they put out 500 to us, provided energy back to IPL. And they used an additional thousand. So we're gonna charge them the thousand subtract off the five hundred they gave us, so we net them out. If they get charged for five hundred. So it's a solar or a uh, wind generated yes system. Okay. And it's what we ex we currently have now. We're not planning on modifying that. Mark, what you're asking is what a recommendation is that what you're asking? Yes, this is kind of the general direction. Uh, of, of the rate design. So we're, we're not approving the final thing. We're <laughs> recommending that you go forward. Right. Along these, this general outline. Okay. Then I changed my vote. Great. <laughs> uh, when I first saw this, I assumed that, that uh, having the five 
classes meant there was going to be a single rate for each class. <coughs> Just for everybody's understanding, because I asked the question earlier, that is not the case. We're still going to have 12 different class subclasses, whatever you want to call them, like we had talked about before. They're embedded in these five and there will be a separate rate for each of those, just like we saw in the previous presentation. So uh, we're not having a single rate for five classes. And I think it is a little bit, it's not clear by, the, by this write-up that that's the case. But I just wanted to make sure that it's on the record for anybody who's, who's questioning if we're gonna have a single rate for each class. We are not gonna have that. Um, that is correct. Um, is the way the Sawbell report was also, they had the same. They classified, um, like for example, right now, we have our residential service, but it has our current RS3 rate has four different rates underneath it. But what Sawbell did is they classified the rate classes as residential, commercial, industrial, that type of stuff. We're going to have that, but the residential will have a residential rate and then you'll have for example a residential with space heating as a separate rate underneath the residential class so in theory there could be 12 you're having these five and some subclasses under them yes you'll have so rate going schedule. back to 12 we have tw what i would say we have we'll have 12 rate schedules but we'll have five rate classes and that's the way the Solvell report was done also Do we write off the money we paid Burns and McDonald? Where do you? We've gotten benefit from it. You might. You oh, know, okay. Might. Yeah, I can read the Solvell report too. I would say Burns and McDonald's has been a huge benefit. They've done a lot of analysis and a lot of comparison, and we spent a lot of time wrestling different things. Do we do AMI? Do we not do AMI? So they've done a lot of work, and their numbers that they have put together are based upon our most current information. I would not recommend that we implement Solvell's rates as published because that was done four, five years ago, and it's not reflective of our environment now. Yes, excuse me, Robert. When we, excuse me, when we visited the slide for LGS for large customers, large commercial customers, it, it didn't seem to me we met our objective. Uh, we still are two of the highest rates on that chart. <clears throat> yes, we are still on some of our stuff will be higher than GMO. Uh, what we came out with is we're going to make sure that A, we're getting everybody 6% across the board. Um, had we, you know, going forward, does that, you know, do we then do maybe targeted rate changes? I would recommend that to get to cost of service and all that stuff. But at this time, we're going across the board with the 6% for everybody. And that's leading us to once we've evaluated where our rates and our expenses have been, then we can come back and look and say, are there other opportunities we can look forward to improving that? One of the things we are going to be doing to help some of the commercial customers is doing the manufacturing rider or adjustment so that the ones that are producing jobs, you know, the larger companies that are producing jobs and providing, you know, revenues for the city that will be putting some type of a manufacturing to make them more competitive. But for the class in general, we're probably still going to be unfortunately higher than GMO at this time. When we embarked on this mission, attracting commercial to independence was, uh, applauded by everyone and we need to do a better job more carrots out there to attract them this doesn't seem to achieve that Those for, manufacturing. for the manufacturing customers the larger customers um, the one customer that uh, wrote us off and went to Blue Springs they would be the ones that would be benefiting from the manufacturing this chart for LGS the large general this chart that I'm looking at is LGS which which is 
comprises most of your commercial. Most of the commercial, yes, but not all of them. But the, you, we will be having that manufacturing ability rider that will be applied to the LGS customers um, in addition to trying to improve the ability for our large power customers, that type of stuff, so that we can be more competitive and be able to bring new and additional business to the city. Yeah. I'm, I know you. I trust you. But uh, I'm in the same place Larry is. It's not part of the, what we're promoting. It's something you're saying we're going to achieve in the future. We're not... Where is it in black and white well, that we're going to... Uh, the manufacturing will be part of this rate design, the special yeah. rate for manufacturing. Yes. Of course. So, yeah, it's just... Be, your point is, that. yeah, we're... I, I This just... Seeing this for the first time today, it just doesn't look like we're hitting the mark, hitting the goal with uh, LGS. No, we'd Not like to be where we are lower, the lowest in the metro for everything. But... What we have achieved is being lowest in the metro for residential, and we're competitive with everybody uh, in everything. But we, like he said, our the work isn't done. But we're going to carve out the manufacturers for a special reduction because that's the job creators that we really want to. Uh, you know, that might be an actual decision that they make in whether they locate in in this community or another one. So we need to. Uh, to do something with that, which is part of the new rate design as well. I mean, we're as he said, we're not really necessarily saying we're done for all time. It's just that I think it is an opportunity to celebrate a, a pretty big victory here uh, based on the council's action to do that rate reduction. And, uh, man, that's you just don't see that every day. And to now to be able to say that we are the, the lowest for in residential in rates is pretty great accomplishment. But um, we hope to be able to say that. For everything uh, at some point well there again it's not part of what we're seeing on paper it's just you know people right. speculating it may not be on the on what was passed by the electric rates committee but it is still the directive that we're being tasked to follow up on and this will be a part of any rates schedules and structures that will be presented to the puab uh, for approval to take to council um, I, I respect and I encourage and I applaud what you've done for our residential customers. They are the bulk of our energy that we uh, sell each year. But when, when we come in the door and we start promoting these things, I never, I didn't hear the word once, we have more, we can attract more residential customers. What people were cheerleading was, we can better the world for our commercial customers and attract them when they come to town. Uh, it doesn't seem like that was accomplished here. We're trying to accomplish uh, as best as we can with everything. You know, ideally, we also need to make sure that whatever changes we make, that IPL will still be financially viable. And to make, you know, because our commercial customers were a little bit higher, to make a bigger rate change on them at this time would make it a little bit more difficult for IPL financially. I think it's something we need to look forward to if we can identify additional areas for revenue improvement or to see if we have additional cost savings, stuff like that, that we can go after. But I, I would agree, we have not, we can't go out and trumpet saying we are the lowest for manufacturing. What we are going to do is put in a rider to help make us more competitive. Okay, do we still have the ability <clears throat> Through the years, IPNL has offered special rates to attract certain customers, mm -hmm. large customers. We still have that ability to do yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was listed as the economic development okay. um, rider. So, yes, yeah, so we would still was. have that, too. Okay, thank you. Um, it's kind of like my comment I made before about the, the 20. I think there's a lot of information that, this summarizes, but it's not clear on, on some of the discussion that we had last time. I presume that the customer charge is still embedded in here, that, but it isn't showing up, right? That there is going to be a customer charge. It's not mentioned here, but and I don't know why some things are mentioned, some things aren't. 
but I just wanted to get that on record that the, that the customer charge is is planned. The, the other thing that I want to mention is I'm also, like Jack, concerned about saying that we don't have to, we won't be increasing our rates for five years, which is a nice statement to make. I presume that what's going to happen is we're going to be dipping in our, to our reserves to, to accomplish that. Um, unfortunately, we have not received any financial reports for the last six, nine months. And I don't blame staff here, but if we're going to be monitoring what our financial situation is to know that we we can abide by that that goal, we need to have good financial data to know what our income versus expenses are. And we don't have a, a clue right now what our income and expenses are. And so I just I just want to make that statement on the record that whoever is responsible for getting financial data out to staff and to us, that that needs to be a high priority for this city. Anything else? Okay. Um, just a question on this draft that was handed to us moments ago. Uh, the five categories, uh, five rate classes that are there we asked a while ago, were there subcategories like under residential? And there were sounded like there were two or three. Could we have a list of how that's going to work? Uh, yes, we're going to be working on doing that. And that's what uh, Burns and McDonald's is going to be putting in their report to make sure that we do this. But we will try so to. So with subcategories, are yes. we back up to 12 or more? Or? Yes, we, we would be at the 12. With the total rate schedules, we're five rate classes but we'd have 12 rate schedules underneath them. Okay, so, so but we, we can put together a chart that shows you what rate classes, you know, what rate schedules belong under which rate class. So this says rate classes shall be, however, we're gonna have not five, we're gonna have 12, and those are not listed. Uh, that's at this time, but we didn't have a chance to put this together. This is similar to what Solvell did in their study. They combine you know, rate schedules under a rate class because they were looking at rate classes for their overall rate changes when they were looking at it. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I think it's time that we uh, move on and I would like to make a motion that we as the board accept this uh, recommendation with the understanding that this is still in the works mm -hmm. and that we will be given the final results prior to going to council and questions answered. And uh, we've already asked some questions that I'm sure that are going to be in there. And so uh, if I could get a second on that motion. A second. Here we go. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? It's very clear, the way I understand it, and I haven't said anything so far, but basically this is just no, this is just an overview right now and you're still working on fine-tuning it. Uh, yes, we're still fine-tuning it, okay. but this gives us the direction that we need to make sure we're completing. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. Um, okay, reports. Um, we have no water pollution control personnel here. Dan's here. <laughs> thank, yeah, but by the way, thank you for that last vote. And yes, uh, we, we don't uh, have... Uh, Lisa was unable to make it, so uh, we don't have a report for WPC. There's really nothing uh, that they uh, had to update John beyond uh, the numbers you got last time about the those prog those uh, projects are in progress. Yeah, there's really nothing much to add to it. Water. I just wanted to give you a little brief update. If anybody's driven down Nolan Road in the last two or three days. They're, we're watering the sod, which means that 
that project is pretty much complete. They've got the sidewalks repaired, uh, the sidewalks open, they're watering the sod because they don't want it to burn up. It's been so dry and hot recently. So that's really good news for that project to been going on for quite a while. And so all that other stuff that's going on is a different person than us. It's not the water department. There's, I don't know what the, somebody's out there spire the gas company somebody's doing some work on the other side of the street so just as soon as we got through somebody else started working there so the other thing i was going to bring up to date is james downey road is a demonstration project that we have just crossed uh, we've got those the water main tied in the uh, new service lines put in and we'll be doing the uh, yard restoration on that too so those two projects are two that have been, uh, been out in the public and I'm going to let, hearing a lot about, so hopefully we're making good progress. It's a good sign. Thanks. Well, you have a question, Daniel. How many uh, wholesale customers do we do we have now? So we still have the 13 wholesale customers. Some of them, you know, it's like, and we wholesale half of our water. You probably know that, Larry, but uh, just to kind of brief. The board doesn't. That's the, why I'm the asking. New board members. So it's really a benefit. The utility's in really good shape because that helps. It's we wholesale half our water. It's a third of our revenue. It's kind of like what they talk about certain rate classes. There, the water we sell water to the wholesaler is a lot cheaper, but we don't have to administer billing. We don't have to administer meter reading. All those various things that add cost to that that weight that rate class. So, uh, it's a great thing that we have. It's something we've had when the city purchased it. The utility it was a private water utility at the time. And we were able to sell, obviously, outside the jurisdiction, which too bad Independence Power and Light doesn't sell half their power to other entities because it would be a lot cheaper just because of the economy of scale. Would it be too much trouble for Matt to get us a copy of the rate for the wholesalers? And we can bring you just a typical, I can bring you maybe one of the most current ones or whatever. But uh, this came up the other day. There's... Uh, questions about how those rates were set so when the city i happen to be here when the city was city purchased the missouri water company you were a private mm -hmm. water utility then too and part of the deal we were governed by the public service commission and because of the public service commission all those wholesalers decided to uh, intervene on the case and the city couldn't buy the utility unless they got all these wholesalers happy and the way they did that was to give all those wholesalers uh, the opportunity to have contracts that were basically forever. Th those rates, they just keep re-upping them. If, if, they don't, if they don't like our rates, we have to go out and do a cost of service study. I think I mentioned it to the, uh, the, our attorney here the other day recently, so I'm kind of familiar with this. But So we have to go out and do the rates. We have to perform a cost of service study done by like a Black Beach or a Burns McDonald or somebody comparable. We have to use a specific American Water Works Association uh, technique on how those rates are calculated. It's a base extra capacity method, uh, utility rate. So what I'm getting at is that we can't jack around with those rates or cause uh, somebody to pay a higher rate than somebody else. So when we do a cost of service study, it has to be the true cost of service to that particular class. Well, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. When we were private, you had to go to the Public Service Commission right. for a rate increase. So now, when we, so have now it, we already have it set. We have it set at that time, but we have contracts with all those folks. And then, then we renew those contracts. I think they're on 20-year increments. Most of them have been renewed. I think we have Sugar Creek. I have hit with the attorney on. There's yeah. one of them that's up right now that we need to address. But uh, what I'm getting at is that those things just keep continue to go on. The only way we can change the rates to those wholesale customers is do a base extra capacity method, AWWA, outside consultant. We can't do it internally. Right. I, and I understand that. I, I just want the board to know what our rate is to the wholesale. Yeah, we can give you the and rate. What 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 a benefit it is to this city. It's it's a great benefit. Okay. And it's a great benefit to the wholesalers too. Well, know. sure it is. Uh, we're 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 charging them a fair rate. Everybody benefits by the economy of scale. So we're selling water to a quarter million people. Yeah. We're, we're not just selling it to we we a gave thousand. in 1974. We gave Kansas City water for a year free. 
you weren't here. I wasn't here, so. No. There's something I don't Junior know. Junior Paris left a valve open okay. at 40 in Nolan. <laughs> that can go both ways, so yeah. what? And Randy Vest is the one that found it. <laughs> so one thing I will tell you with uh, Kansas City valves open the opposite direction of our valves. Yeah. So it's not unusual for we have to check those valves and make sure that that doesn't happen. The other thing is, is that the water can go either direction. You can open a valve and if our pressure happens to be higher than hers, our water will go that way. If our pressure is lower than theirs, the water will come our way. So well, they found it was open, so they opened their faucets. So there you go. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing that with everybody. Larry. <laughs> Prior to you being here. Okay, it's all good then. So it's a timely point of view. <laughs> it was time, but I, I just wanted to make sure that you know we're aware. We feel that the uh, that the the rates that the wholesale customers are getting are fair for both parties. Uh, we benefit by that. They benefit by that, and it's it's a good it's a good thing for both for all of us. So. Yes, it is. Thank Thanks you, for, Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just a small thing for Dan. I might have mentioned this to you. Dining Country Meadows here about a month ago or so. Uh, there was a water leak. The guys were very efficient. Came down, cleaned it up. Uh, you know, fixed the leak. Set the ground, uh, kept the place safe, uh, and especially down here with the older people, they're a little picky. So uh, they did a heck of a job. Just let you know. Well, thank you. I don't have to to staff. They're really good about repairing. Anything further from IPL? Yes, one thing I wanted to mention to you is uh, the council meeting on Monday is one that we'd like to invite the members of PUAB to also attend. It's uh, one that we've talked about for a while. So there'll be a presentation by a vice president from uh, Southwest Power Pool, gonna be there to explain a little further about uh, our relationship with SPP, which as you know, that's where we buy all our electricity through them and they actually control our generating assets. So they're gonna be there. And it's really important now because especially, you know, in light of our, uh, planned closure of the Blue Valley plant. Uh, you know, we're, we already have a uh, request in to uh, SPP, and we're supposed to hear back in November as to whether or not they'll approve that closure and the replacement of that capacity with that ONETA power purchase agreement that you all know about and uh, weighed in on previously. So uh, this will be great to hear from SPP to talk a little bit more about how they work and our relationship with them. Also at that meeting, we're going to have representatives from MPUA talking about mutual aid. You know, that's been an issue that's been talked about. Uh, you know, we're, we're well known as a participant in mutual aid activities, Power and Light is, uh, and they'll be there the, uh, to talk about, you know, the need uh, for mutual aid participation, the uh, how reimbursement works when we get reimbursement for storm restoration efforts and, and all that sort of thing. So there's, I know we've got a lot of questions on that too. So uh, these are per, two pretty important informational type presentations that are gonna be at the next uh, council study session and they wanted to make sure that, you, that you're invited to, to come. Will we have Maybe. a section on well, we can we can section you off an area. <laughs> sure. You yeah, really you do already. Is this Monday morning? Monday, yeah. This Monday. Yes, Monday. Uh -huh. So, Mark, did I hear you correct say that you have submitted the request to SGP for the Oneida study? Yeah, they're doing the uh, transmission. Yeah, the tra yeah. costs, and so when we get, we'll know in November whether that is going to work, and then we get their permission, and then we have a six month period after that before we can actually make the the change. So it isn't that it would be closing imminent that it, we're still kind of talking about, you know, a June one, probably a uh, time that they would authorize us to switch that capacity out in that way. Any questions of any of the three departments? And let's, don't look at me, man. Let's, <laughs> let's move on to the uh, board comments. Jack? Uh, Mike? Mike? Nope. Okay. I just want to thank everybody for showing up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have two or three quick things, Mark. There's the same things that we've gone over before. Uh, one of them is uh, 
Garland asked, and I'm asking again, that we have a dashboard uh, look at things. We have not had that now for some months. And uh, it's long overdue, and we ought to have it. And so next month, if we don't have it, you're going to see some jumping up and down from here. You won't be here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Dan, take note. Uh, another thing is the timeliness of this data. Guys, we got some of this stuff. Yes, there must be 20 pages here or similar. Uh, the afternoon prior to our meeting. And there's just no way to be able to go through it all, get any sense of it uh, in comparison to what we needed to do today. And then uh, another piece came from the city council uh, halfway through our meeting. Uh, how to make sense of this? You, you, you can't when we're, when we're doing all this. I would like to have it be these things in a more timely manner. We've asked for them to be a week ahead. Uh, we even voted on that some months back and all kinds of things. And I understand things come up and once in a while we won't meet those kinds of deadlines. But it's difficult at best to make sense of this stuff. Really. And we try. Um, just a review. The plant is still on track for April 1. Mark? What's that again? The plant is is on track for April 1 to be closed? No, it's more like a June 1 for closure of the Blue Valley plant you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, right. No, we have six months after we get a uh, notification from SPP. And so that. Okay, so we're looking at June now? Yeah, June 1 is kind of what, is okay. what we. Yeah, I mean, if it's possible, do it sooner, but that's what we're talking about. And how about the little tin count powder plants we call them out here in the substations? Are those going to. Where are we with those with regard to. Well, we've time of service, cost of service, uh, cost of upkeep, and well, retiring them. Yeah, we've already, we've done a uh, a uh, review. At the last council meeting, Councilman Roberson asked for that very thing, like wanted to have some sort of a of a look at what the future is for the CTs. We've already done a uh, report on the CTs. Uh, again, their main function is to provide paper capacity to SPP. So they're providing 100% of their main responsibility. Plus, they do get called on occasionally to fire up to produce power that SVP buys from us. So uh, it looks like the analysis is there's nothing cheaper than doing what we're doing now, uh, keeping them going. Now, they won't last forever. So there does need to be a plan for uh, replacing them, but it's not something you have to do immediately and it may not be the thing that you want to do right this minute with the whole blue valley closure which is going to really take a lot of our of our uh effort in the next uh, you know few months so okay uh, following up on that are we uh, are we online with staffing staff reduction with regard to moving ahead to june now and closing the plant well again until we know we're closing it we don't we won't do anything and we have to keep open uh, and that's one of the things that the SBP will clarify for you, but uh, I mean, or that he will verify is that we have to be o able to generate whenever they call us. So we do not have, um, but our, if as far as working on on plans for if we are allowed to close and how that would be done, yes, we're 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 doing that. Okay. Uh, one more comment. I would uh, entertain a motion to have a special meeting on the 10th of October to go over some of this stuff again and maybe come up with additional questions. I think it's very, very important. And uh, I think we've glossed over it. Uh, and I uh, would entertain that. Just, oh, you want to make a motion? Or would you? Motion? No, you won't. Okay, I'll make the motion that we do have this meeting on the 10th. 10th. To have a have a another study on this. Second. I'll second, I guess. Yeah, I'll okay. second. Any comment about this? We'd have a special meeting to go over some of this in more detail uh, here in this room at two thirty on October the tenth. Any comments? Well, and and. <coughs> No, you're not doing the third. You're doing the tenth. 
We're just going to do the third already. We are? Yeah. Okay, we're... 24th. <coughs> well, I thought we were doing... That's, that. a, that's the actual meeting. Okay. That's the actual October meeting. That's October 24th. Yeah. You want this on the 10th. What this would doing? be a special meeting on what the 10th. On October 3rd. If needed. I have nothing in my calendar for the 3rd. Mr. Chair, we have this room booked the first Thursday of the month for a special meeting tentatively, yeah. and that's why we have this on the agenda every month. Okay. Um, so and here it says October 3rd for a special meeting. So if you'd like to move it, we would need to check the room availability. I see. Well, you Thank you. Then. No, we'll change it. You're going to leave it the 3rd? 3rd. That's fine. You already, already have it. You already have it on the schedule. Okay. I'm sorry. I just hadn't gotten that. Okay. Okay. So the third. Okay. Great. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. I didn't see it. Um, you get the big bucks, coming please. on down through the uh, comments. Any comments, Garland? The only thing I would, I don't know where our to do list is, but I think we had mentioned in the past, and I just wanted to reiterate it. That I'd like to have a presentation. I think a lot of us would have of um, how IPL is supporting city services in terms of budget and personnel and so forth. We keep finding new things, but we've never had a presentation that says to what extent IPL is a provider of, of services to the city and, and it's out of the IPL budget. So I'd Including like sure street lights. Street possibly. lights and yeah. everything yeah. else. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we get that on the agenda for some future meeting. Okay. Anything else? So so we'll be coming on October 3rd. Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Make a motion we adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thanks for very everybody for contributing so much. Say hi, Dan.